in the back? Can you hear me? Don't get used to it. Um, we are super excited to have Dan Swain back here tonight to talk about this book, Separating Some Fact from Fiction. Um, by way of that, this institution has a, had a catalog in 1983. It said Albert Bierstadt came here every single summer and touched up the painting, the domes of the Yosemite. It's not clear he came here one single time. <laughs> Several people really looked to try to find out the facts, uh, trying to find out if you ever stayed at the St. Jay House, reading the Caledonian, now that you can read the paper online. No proof that Albert Bierstadt was ever in this town, but it went from, you know, being apocryphal to being oral to being written down. And <laughs> so when I came here, I was a baby librarian, and I listened to all the docents, and they would start at the front desk, and I just, you know, mimicked everything they said. Like, these are the stories that are all true. So I would say that. And then it, it occurred to me, like, every year? <laughs> Probably not. So it is going to be, and it, I, I have actually read the entire book, I am proud to say. I have um, come to understand some things I never knew. Some of the houses they live in, I didn't even realize were still standing. Embarrassing. But um, it's really been great to learn all these things. And we look forward to Dan really informing us. Um, we'll have a Q&A after. Dan has copies of the, his book here. So if you haven't got one already, you can get one. You will sign it. So just a couple of things. Um, two upcoming events, and I'll be quick. Um, next Wednesday, February 5th, uh, the next first Wednesday, we'll be here. Photography as Social Justice. Donna Ann McAdam, McAdams sits down with curator John Kalaki to discuss her work and shows her empathetic black and white portraits of performing artists, AIDS activists, political protests, people living with schizophrenia, Appalachian farmers, cloistered nuns, and others. Uh, there's an exhibit of her work that will go up that same day at Catamount Arts. There's an opening there at 4 o'clock. So you could go there, see her work, come here, and here we talk about it with John Kalaki, who's the curator of that show. Two weeks from tonight, um, the next Arts and Culture Talk will be visible in Vermont, Our Stories, Our Voices. Sean Moulier will lead a panel and community discussion on the experiences of people of color throughout the state of Vermont, challenging racial microaggressions and racist acts and behaviors that often go unchecked. There'll be an exhibit here in this space. Um, so a difficult conversation about a difficult subject, but something that's going on in this state, and it's good to be able to face things like this and have a, have a talk. This arts and culture event is sponsored by the Friends of the Athenaeum, and this series is underwritten by Philip and Mary Lou Meyer, who live in Connecticut, but whose parents lived here, and they love this place, and they are supporters of this series. To our speakers. Dan Swain Bank writes about local history with events connected to state and national history. He grew up in St. Johnsbury and attended St. Johnsbury schools as a member of the academy class of 1965. A former high school and college writing teacher, Dan had a 40-year teaching career in Wisconsin, Lebanon, New Hampshire, and at Linden State College. He is the author of Mr. Vale is in Town, Theodore N. Vale, AT&T, and his Linden Legacy and the FAR disease, one family's 150-year battle against ALS. Dan lives in North Danville, Vermont, with his wife Mary, who is also here. And Mary is our board chair. So please welcome Dan Swainman. My voice is sometimes kind of soft, so feel free to give me a signal of some kind if I'm not loud enough or another signal, you know, whatever signal you want to convey. You know. <laughs> whatever works. Um, thank you, Bob, and thank you all for coming. I've been looking forward to this event um, because I anticipate we're going to have some people here who maybe grew up in St. John's Bay as I did and or know some other stories and notions. And so um, Bob has suggested that I limit my remarks to maybe 45 minutes for 
talking and reading, and um, then let's have a nice discussion. And have it. Happy to bluff my way through any questions that you have. <laughs> um, so here we are in Horace's gift to the town of St. John's. This is Horace over here in the gold frame, and Horace greeted you in the white uh, marble statue as you came up. Horace is second generation, as I determined in the book. So I chose to call Erastus, Thaddeus, and Joseph as the first generation, being the generation which established themselves and started all that the family did for St. Charlesbury. So that makes Horace um, second generation, along with Franklin, who gave us the, um, the museum and others whom I'll be describing. Um, I was watching television the other day, Channel 5, the local news, and there was Phil Scott standing in the corridor of the State House answering questions, and over his right shoulder was Horace. And <laughs> picture of Horace, a uh, painting of Horace as, as a former governor. Subsequent to that, I think I read an article or saw a piece about that they want to increase diversity among the State House portraits hanging around the State House, so Horace might not be looking over anybody's shoulder at, if he's put in a back room. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit, kind of go over with you the story, which many of you know a little bit. But I divided my book into four sections. And what I'd like to do is go through those and um, do a little bit of readings from each section. The, those uh, four sections, strands as I call them, that run through the book are the factory, of course, the family, of course, the town and how the Fairbanks transformed the town and all of their endowments and gifts to the town. And then the fourth section or fourth strand <coughs> is about the issues that face the family and that have uh, led the discussion and uh, probing into their lives and their, their ideas. Issues like slavery, issues like um, temperance and um, separation of church and state and things like that. So the story begins, as most of you know, with the arrival of the family from Brimfield, Massachusetts in 1815. There were three sons. Two were already here. Or one was already here, excuse me. Two were traveling with Major Joseph Fairbanks and his wife Phoebe, Paddock. And uh, one son had already been here some time, and that's Erastus, the sen senior son. He was here studying law with his uncle Ephraim Paddock. Um, that and several other ventures didn't work out for her. Erastus will come back. But um, eventually, they went into business together as a what I call the triumvirate, Erastus, Thaddeus, and their younger brother, Joseph. So it, the amazing growth of their firm is the first chapter of the story. And that started in around uh, 1830 with the invention, as you know, of the platform scale. Before that time, Erastus had had a number of early careers. He really he was 32 years old when the two brothers joined together. That was in 19, 1824. And um, he had been, as I said, studying the law. He'd also practiced uh, school teaching. Um, he had practiced storekeeping. And of course, he, he, they came from a farming family, so that was another <laughs> option for him. Um, there, once uh, Thaddeus invented the platform scale, they went into business together. Then there's just this incredible story of amazing growth, uh, especially of the faculty, but excuse me, of the factory, but also their ability to endow the town. And we'll talk about each of those. The second generation all uh, own grand homes, especially the men of the second generation. Those are involved in the fac factory. Um, and they, it's the E&T Fairbanks Company was quite a cash cow. It made a lot of money for this family, most of which, much of which, they endowed to the town. Um, they endowed the town with. Um, 
But they also, as a family, produced two governors, Erastus and our, our man Horace. And they also built the railroads um, north, south, and east, west, um, brought the railroads here. St. Johnsbury, at, when they first came, uh, when they first went into business together, was not a very promising place for an industrial hub. Um, you had the, no roads, uh, you did not have good river travel at, at all above Barnet. Um, you had the White Mountains to the east, the Green Mountains to the west. It wasn't a very promising place to start an industrial empire. And I don't think they thought that that's what they were going to do. I think they were wagon makers and they, were, they did some milling. They did some other uh, work with marrying wood and metal. Um, but eventually um, they started manufacturing scales and realized that was their best bet. So I think it grew incrementally. And um, they didn't choose St. John's Bay as a place for the enormous <coughs> factory which it would eventually become, as shown on the cover of my book. Um, as I said, the early businesses were in milling, wagons, plows, stoves, various cast iron implements, and so forth, and finally the scale. Uh, various historians who have studied the company, including especially Alan Yale, who taught at Linden State, identified four key obstacles that were in their way that they, by dint of their in ambition and their creativity, they overcame. The first was transportation, how to bring, as I said, how to bring um, raw materials in and ship product out. The second was capital. There were no banks. They weren't of money. They hadn't had people to go to for to raise money to, to grow the business. Um, they did that a number of ways. The third was workers. This was a pretty sparsely populated area. And as the factory grew, they needed more and more and more workers, skilled, skilled workers or trainable, learnable. Um, and <clears throat> Alan Neal makes the point that it was good in a way that they were an early industry in that people weren't trained in anything else. They, they could become trained in the way that Fairbanks brothers needed them. The scholars over the years have used various markers to measure the growth of the, of the factory. The number of workers is one. The payroll in, in dollars is another one. Um, the number of sales in dollars is another measure. And also the size of the plant, the sheer acreage that it occupied, various ways in which it had been do documented and tracked over the years so that they could uh, measure the growth of the plant. It is unprecedented in the state. Um, Earl Newton, state historian, in publishing his book, um, in 1946, said this about the Fairbanks. Many a Vermont mechanic, anticipating the modern miracles of the machine age in his own ingenious fashion, but none of them built permanent industries around their inventions except one, the Fairbanks, of course. And for that matter, still going, uh, part of my Researchers to spend some time out at the, the Fairbanks plant, and they're still producing uh, scales today, high quality scales. Very small amount of international sales, but it's still happening. <clears throat> but also, in addition to their unprecedented success as industrialists, there isn't, as I haven't made a thorough search of this, but there isn't another town in Vermont that has each of these elements that has the endowments, that had provided the jobs, <coughs> that um, hired or employed so many people. Um, the Proctors of Proctor or the Hartness family or various other people, the people from the um, marble and extractive industries. None of them really endowed a town with so much as, as we are blessed to have in this one, at least as far as I know. <clears throat> in 
We'll get into some of the issues a little bit later about the running of the factory. But um, suffice it to say, as long as the Fairbanks were running it, um, we, we need to be careful to measure the Fairbanks and weigh the Fairbanks um, against today's standards. The fact of the matter is there are no women employed by the Fairbanks firm as long as Fairbanks were running it. There was no OSHA. There was no collective bargaining. And all kinds of things which we take for granted today. So um, we, we need to somehow measure the firm's generosity and responsibility against some standard of that era rather than today's, because it's, it's just a different place and a different environment. The second strand is about the family. And that's a fairly interesting standard examination. Um, birth, death, who married whom, what are good marriages, what were not so good marriages, the rise and fall of the family wealth and property. This is a rise and fall kind of story. <clears throat> How they spent their money, their homes and the home life, and also their involvement, which members of the family were involved in the business. When the Fairbanks boys came to town, and their second generation also, they married well. Um, I had already mentioned Ephraim Paddock. But if you look through Edward Taylor's, Edward Taylor Fairbanks history of St. Johnsbury, and you look at the various ventures that were part of the growth of the town, if you look for Fairbanks, you will see them as part of members of this committee or the, this venture and so forth. But you also want to look for Jewett's, Taylor's, Stone's, Clatt. The, they, the men and women of the second generation married people who were involved in law, education, journalism, ministry, retail. And so the, if you look at the extended family, it gives you a picture of their involvement in the town, which was significant. It's almost on every page of Edward Taylor Fairbanks' history, which was published in 1914. Thirteen men and were in the business over three generations. Thirteen men and women were in the second generation. And on the second generation, all but one of the men, six of seven, went into the business. The one who didn't was Edward Taylor Fairbanks, who was a preacher. He was a librarian here. And then he was the historian. It is a rags to riches story in this sense, in terms of the family. Um, they made a lot of money, and they spent a lot of it in town, but also in their home life and building grand homes, as Bob mentioned, which are around town. And they spent their money on themselves, mainly in the homes, in the furnishings for the home, and artwork in their homes, but also in travel. And they went around the world, and for Franklin and others, that was part of their lifestyle, is to get artifacts and cultural items from other countries and bring it back. Um, the rise and fall story, the fall part of the rise and fall story, <coughs> is that in 1916, the family lost control of the company. And it was bought by Fairbanks Morse, which was headed by Charles Hosmer Morse, who was former Fairbanks employee who had gone to Chicago and, and w was head of a selling house in Chicago, which eventually became Fairbanks Morse, and eventually became an enormous conglomerate with all kinds of other business other than selling Fairbanks scales. And um, that was the loss of the company in 1916. By that time, all of the men named Fairbanks were dead. Uh, there was one member of the family who was a son-in-law who was actually president of the company at the end in 1916. But other members of the family had married and joined other professions, and it's a kind of a, a natural process, um, which I'll talk and talk about later. Um, the symbol of the loss was the loss of Undercliff. Um, Undercliff. <coughs> This mansion going up on the hill over here was the grandest of them all. It was a, a beautiful home surrounded by greenhouses and gardens and uh, the golf course and so forth. Um, in 19, 
22, the Brooks family, as they were called, um, Franklin's son-in-law, the Brooks family um, had to sell on the cliff and kind of ignominiously sell all of their possessions at auction. And then they, they moved, eventually moved out of town. So that's the symbolic part of the fall. It, it wasn't a fall in many, in many branches of the family tree, but it was sad of that one. Um, and that was part of what I call, or what other people have called, the three-generation rule. You might have heard this. There is a saying among wealth advisors that, quote, the first generation of a wealthy family makes the money, the second generation maintains it or spends it, and the third generation blows it. <laughs> Another version, I think it's from China, actually, is shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. <laughs> the Fabank story seems to fit that pattern described, except that the family's wealth, as derived from the scale company, barely lasted into the third generation. Most gen branches of the Fairbanks family in the third generation apparently lived comfortable and even wealthy lives, but with income not derived from the ministry, with income derived from the ministry, law, medicine, journalism, and education, or in other businesses other than waiting. The second generation, the children of Erastus, Thaddeus, and Joseph, was composed of 11 persons who lived into adulthood. Of those 11, six were men, five women, and they all married. The five women all married well, but none of the husbands or their children joined the firm. Of the six men, five joined the company, Horace, Charles, Franklin, Henry, and William. Of their children, three were boys, five were girls. And of the three boys, only William's son, Joseph, was involved with the St. John Three Scale Works as a member of the executive committee. And Henry's son, Robert, had a career with the firm, but not in St. John's Brief. Charles' son, Frederick, lived in Europe and, as mentioned before, was a pianist and composer. So um, that describes the three third generation rule. One other perspective on that. To, a professional, to professional guardians of wealth, the pattern of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations is all too familiar and results from a set of forces that are very hard to counter. Occurring to one analyst of the trend, very few first generation estates pass even to the second generation intact. They're naturally split among the children who then go their separate ways. And the Fairbanks second generation totaled 12 sons and daughters who lived into adulthood. Families such as the DuPonts, the Kennedys, or the Rockefellers, who seem to pass their wealth down through the generations, are actually the exception. The solution, according to the estate planners, is an estate planner. <laughs> there were some differences within the family. There are several places in the history of the family where we look for differences of whether there was a split, such as when the North Church and the South Church split. Some people have suggested that that was either the cause of the family turmoil was a cause of the split or a result of the split. I didn't think it was either, but um, you can read the evidence in the book, see for yourself. There was, as part of the ending, uh, a marital scandal, which was very embarrassing for a family like theirs, which had preached and led a very up uplifting life, upright life. There was a marital scandal, a, a desertion and divorce. And there was a financial sc scandal, which I'll des describe later a devastating audit report in 1887. <clears throat> to review a few elements of the strand in the book about the town, there were the four endowments, which you're familiar with, the Academy, the Athenaeum, and the Museum, and the YMCA. Some of you remember the YMCA building and its history? Um, it was right across the street. So if you head down, Eastern Avenue, you go by the corner building, and it's the next little building, and it's a little green triangle, or it's a white triangle tonight. Um, it's a little place where the, there was a beautiful building, which is a YMCA, which is a Fairbanks 
family gift uh, from Henry Fairbanks. Um, but it didn't last as long, it, it lasted long at all as a town institution. It never made its way the way this institution has and the museum has in, in the academy. And eventually it was uh, actually given to the Athenaeum for a few years, but they didn't make much of it. It became a law offices and then burned in 1984. In addition to those four institutions, however, the firm in, in 1866 hired architect Lambert Packard. And so they had a big Im impact on the physical look of the town. Um, they used Lambert Packard in a lot of different ways. Sometimes he was kind of on his own to do architectural work. Sometimes he worked for the Fairbanks as clerk of the works, which such as with this building. He wasn't the architect of this building, but he oversaw the construction of it. And um, so they had a big impact in the town. Part of their legacy is, I think, of the look of the town and the fine buildings. Uh, the Lambert Packard buildings are, are all over town, large and small. Um, in addition, north and south churches, hospitals, bringing the county seat here from Danville, still a sore point, I guess, <laughs> um, and building the courthouse. Also, um, the aqueduct and the current uh, water system in St. Johnsbury was originally a Fairbanks uh, project owned by them and to subscribe to it and eventually became the town's water system at a price, as I understand it. Um, the p pattern that was established in their town activities would go something like this. The town would recognize a need of some kind, such as a courthouse, when the county seat, if the county seat was going to be here, they'd need, they'd need a courthouse. The Fairbanks would be involved in some sort of a committee to do the planning, the budgeting, and the fundraising for the for the activity, whatever it is, or the building, whatever it is. The money would be raised, and by the second generation, the Fairbanks family did have a lot of wonderful contacts with wealthy people. And um, the money would be raised according to the budget which had been set. And then they would say, okay, let's build it, and they would start. Often the Fairbanks company would be the builder. Um, their, their construction arm would be the builder. Then what would happen is that one member of the Fairbanks family would say, if we run over our costs, we'll pick up the tab. And they did on numerous occasions. Um, most, one I most read about most recently was the North Church, where they built a beautiful big stone church. And they were way over budget on that. And the Fairbanks family just picked up the surplus. So that was the pattern. In terms of the strand of politics and, and issues, the two pressing local issues were temperance and compulsory church. And you've probably heard that um, the Fairbanks supposedly made a covenant with their workers. If you're going to work here, especially if you're going to be in management, you have to attend church every Sunday and no drink, no drinking. I think that particular covenant evolved over time to be either go to church or stay out of the, stay out of the way, stay, out, stay hidden on Sunday morning. And if you're going to drink, don't be drinking on the street or, or be found. There is no disputing the fact that the Fairbanks men of the first two generations were paternalistic. That is, they did care about the after-hours habits of their workers. They did not tolerate profanity or immorality among their workers. They did characterize their relations with their workers as being like father and son. Erasmus was often quoted as saying, you should always come to me as a father. And we can assume that if a worker was rumored to be drunk, profane, or breaking the Sabbath, Erasmus might summon him in. In response to an article in the Claremont, New Hampshire National Eagle, which describes sobriety and Sabbath keeping as conditions of employment at Fairbanks, Erasmus, in private correspondence, 
denied that these were hiring conditions, writing, we expect no pledges, we exact no pledges, and make no arbitrary rules. And the independence of the workers would not stand for it. So he had, a, at least I think he's being honest, they had a sense that this wasn't going to continue to work for much longer. He drew a distinction between hiring and retention. Um, we endeavor to select men who, as choose to respect themselves, he explained. But he went on to admit that if they do not respond to inducements for them to improve, the firm would be bound to, quote, exchange them for others. <laughs> the Caldoyan reported in June of 1880 that James Morgan, I hope that's not a distant relative of any of you, James Morgan was drunk on Decoration Day, which is the forerunner of Memorial Day, and was fired from the scale works. That made the paper. So that describes the paternalism of the family and of, of the firm. In terms of state issues, uh, in order to build a railroad, you need to get a charter from the state. And eventually, the Fairbanks family had a kind of a nice relationship with the government in that um, because they were involved in the legislature and government, they, were, they, had, they knew a lot of people and they could get a charter. And because they were involved in the railroads, um, they, they had influence, they met a lot of people and had influence in government. So it worked both ways. But also in Erastus's two governorships, two government governor terms, and Erastus's, they also involved themselves in temperance issues, also education, justice, and prisons. They produced two governors and six other legislators in the family. Uh, in terms of the other issue which I've mentioned is <clears throat> the issue of inclusion and tolerance. When, when the firm started up and the Fairbanks family became first influential in this community, it was fairly hem uh, homogeneous. In other words, People didn't mind, as a condition of employment, that they had to go to church and they couldn't drink because they didn't go to church and they didn't drink anyway. But gradually, that changed. Mores changed and people's attitudes changed. and So they had to stifle some of their biases and, and be more inclusive. This sentence here struck me. This is from the uh, Academy Charter. St. J.A. trustees should be men of piety, and members in good standing of some orthodox congregational church. The way I read that is, you didn't just have to be a Protestant, you had to be a Congregationalist. So you didn't have to just be a Congregationalist, you had to be of an orthodox congregational church, wherever that is, and in good standing. Other than that, um, you, you, you would not be a headmaster of the academy, and some of you know the history of the academy, Eventually, they actually had to bring the family back in, re reach out to current generations to get to hire the first Presbyterian uh, <laughs> headmaster. And then, uh, of course, that, that rule was stretched several other ways, and it was including, the, I believe, three Catholic headmasters in a row with uh, Vince Dernan, Bernie Mayo, and Tom Lovett, the current one. And of course, it was stretched even more this year with the hiring of the first female head of the school. And eventually, the town became more varied and heterogeneous. <coughs> and um, there were just Protestant and Congregational churches for a while. But then, gradually, um, various other people came to work at the factory, people of other faiths. And the, um, the Fairbanks family and Fairbanks managers at least had to kind of stifle their biases. In particular, um, the biggest challenge probably was the influx of Irish, uh, French Canadian, and Italian workers. And um, they changed the character of the town. If you grew up here, you can remember the Catholic enclave. It was down Prospect Street behind the museum. I remember when I was a kid, there was the St. J. Hospital. There was a nurse's quarters. There was a beautiful church. 
there were two schools and there were Catholic kids used to walk by Summer Street School where I was playing and go over to their schools. And gradually, um, the, <coughs> the Fairbanks had to kind of, um, I think, adjust their ex expectations, especially in terms of diversity. <coughs> to get at their attitudes, I found a, a little passage which I'd like to share with you. It is clear from several sources that in the 19th century, Catholics were considered them, while white Anglo-Saxon Protestant residents who had founded and built the town were considered us. To provide one example of attitudes, in the 1880s special edition of the Caledonian mentioned in this chapter, the Caledonian writer, presumably Charles M. Stone, who was married to Erastus Fairbanks' daughter, quoted a furniture maker, an undertaker, named Charles A. Calderwood, talking about, quote, our Catholic friends. Calderwood informed Stone that, quote, while occasionally one of our own people will cheat him out of his pay for a coffin, he has never been served that way by a Catholic. Whatever the Catholic may do in other respects, he is not mean enough to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what mean it means, I'm not quite sure. But I think it shows the, the prevailing attitude. This is 1880. Some his, histories and minutes of the Fairbanks Executive Committee in the early 20th century suggest that Italians were the prime agitators for collective bargaining, a, a stance that would be met with much resistance by the Fairbanks firm managers. In addition, Italian and French Catholics retained their own language and customs, including the Latin Mass. In many, any case, the language here and there makes it clear that the town in Fairbanks, Stone was the husband of Sarah Fairbanks, while welcoming new immigrants and workers did not, at least at the beginning, did not consider them to be strong or our own people. Um, both the Alan Yale and Perry Viles have done a study of the population and the de demographics of Fairbanks workers by looking at last names. And so they came up with some tentative numbers about uh, people from different backgrounds and uh, Catholic origins also. On slavery, um, looking at the issues, um, the Fairbanks firm was in a delicate position, especially when Erastus became Civil War governor. The long debate, of course, about whether the Civil War was fought for to end slavery or to bring, keep the Union together or, um, or to uh, <coughs> uh, somehow uh, beat up the South because of their daring to split from the country. Um, Erastus did not speak too much about slavery when he was governor. He tended to uh, make the other point. But um, in a book entitled Rockdale by a man named Wallace, he takes a look at the delicate position of cotton manufacturers in the North. In fact, he even makes the, well, I'll read it. And, of course, the Fairbanks were not cotton manufacturers, but they were cotton weighers. And so they were, they were involved in the cotton trade in that way. And, and one little essay that I read, an uh, article from Christian Century about Erastus, it talked about this conflict, and it was written by his, his other, another one of his son in laws So here's the way Wallace describes the moral dilemma. Northern manufacturers, especially proprietors of cotton mills, were in a delicate position in the years leading up to the Civil War. As analyzed in Anthony Wallace at Rockdale, the growth of an American village in the early Industrial Revolution, which focuses on a town in Pennsylvania, cotton manufacturers 
lived in anti-slavery regions and probably were anti-slavery themselves, but their businesses had long and deep ties to the South and its cotton growers. The same could have been said of the Fairbankses who were involved in the weighing of cotton. The Fairbanks Company had sales representatives all over the South and were thus complicit to a degree in the slave trade. Wallace refers to the dilemma as a moral paradox. While deploring slavery on principle, the northern manufacturers nevertheless had his merchant houses located in the southern regions. In fact, Wallace writes that the expansion of cotton manufacturing in the north actually resulted in the expansion of slavery in the south because the southern cotton growers had a new market. They didn't have to send their, the cotton to England. Thus, it was emotionally necessary to dissociate the moral issue of slavery from the economic realities of manufacturing and weighing cotton. In addition to the economic realities then, there were the moral issues. As the evangelical industrialists in a strongly and morally anti-slavery state, the Fairbanks is especially in the years leading up to the war between the states, needed to find a way to deal with this moral dissonance. They were an unabashed Christian moralist after all. The position apparently taken by the three brothers was to embrace the colonization movement. That is, to support the return of freed slaves to Africa. All three of the brothers are listed as contributors to the American Colonization Society as early as 1842. That placed the Fairbanks in what Wallace calls the conservative wing of the anti-slavery movement, as opposed to William Lloyd Garrison or Thaddeus Stevens and others in the so-called radical wing. As Wallace puts it, people like the Fairbanks wanted to free the slaves, but not hire them or live with them, and that was a responsible position. So that's kind of the position that I think that they took about slavery with little evidence that we found. Other national issues that they involved themselves were more um, advantageous to their businesses, such as making laws and, <coughs> and currency laws. Um, so I'm going to finish up by discussing uh, what I might call the weighing of the legacy. The Fairbanks had one particular loud, persuasive critic. His name was Charles Edward Russell. And his own biographer, I've read a biography of Russell. Um, his own biographer s says that he's not quite sure why he disliked the Fairbanks and, and uh, was so critical of them. He was a muckraker. And so he may have kind of um, projected the criticism of the satanic mills in other towns and assumed that the same was true of, of St. Johnsbury. Um, but Russell wrote, in plain terms, the town was a barony, and so far as autocratic rule was concerned, produced neatly the status of a Rhine village in the Middle Ages. The baronial family lived in the castle on the heights, and the townspeople kowtowed below. Now you could see that if you want to read that into it, and that's what you see in this, this picture here of Undercliffs going up and the little houses kowtowing down below. <laughs> um, it seems to portray that. But there's some ways you can look at it. First of all, this was nice housing. This was not hovels. It was not um, uh, little homemade shacks. Um, and the uh, houses were all moved when Undercliff was built, but they weren't torn down. And Susan Aiken, realtor Susan Aiken, has done a study of these houses, She's found all 12 of them all over that neighborhood of the so-called uh, Four Seasons neighborhood on Fifth Street and Spring Street and Summer Street and so forth. So it looks like the, the little, the, tap, the little, it was called Paddy Acres. So it looks like the, the relatively new Irish hires are having to live with the little hovels while the mansion goes up on the hill. 
kowtow in some way. Um, except that they weren't really hovels. They weren't peasants. And, and I just, looking at things in those two ways happened to me several times in my reading and my study. Here's another one. Um, the Fairbanks had a company store. Was it Tennessee Early Ford, who, Ernie Ford who wrote a song about 16 times with the line, I owe my soul to the company store? Well, that suggests that in that setting, that type of setting that the song is about, that you would be underpaid. The only place you could buy certain things was the company store. And you bought them on credit, and you got deeper and deeper in debt to the company. Well, the Fairbanks had a company store, but it seemed, according to Alan Yale's studies, it seemed to work almost the opposite. And that is, they were paid well enough so that they could open an account, like a checking account, savings account, at the company store, in effect lending money to the company and being, paying it, receiving interest for it. And it was one of the ways in which the early Fairbanks family factory operation uh, raised capital. Well, that's another version of the company store story. It's just too, like, like that picture there. It's another way of looking at the same set of facts. Um, Charles Edward Russell's criticisms were, were these. First of all, the, the workers were underpaid. Secondly, they had to go to church, and they had to avoid li liquor, and they had to be hypocrites in going to church because they didn't really want to, but they had to keep it as a condition of employment. And they were underappreciated. He used a particular case of one man that he, that he knew where he was a student here in the academy, who he thought was well educated, but um, didn't, uh, able, wasn't able to ever kind of move out of the boarding house and have his own place. Well, that is kind of overturned by the studies that people have found. Homeownership among the Fairbanks workers, patterns of homeownership among the Fairbanks workers, and um, the variety of housing options that the Fairbanks provided for people. Um, both Alan Neal and Perry Biles also, Perry Biles also looked at other issues which were tended to be criticisms of sweat, uh, sweat factories and sweatshops, and such as child labor, safety issues, uh, accidents on the job, and, and pay, of course. And working conditions. Uh, Alan Neal also looked at longevity, people choosing to work at Fairbanks for a long while and found that that was so substantial. And also their social prominence. How many members of the Fairbanks firm were prominent in town, in church offices or town offices and so forth? Um, there's a term for particular type of capitalism, which is referred to as Christian capitalism, which is from that same book that I read about earlier, uh, entitled Rockdale, that looked at the Pennsylvania community. And Christian capitalism, according to this book, had about seven tenets, and I'll read to you just a couple of them. We don't have a, there was no Christian capitalism society or newsletter that you could subscribe to uh, so that it would make us tie us, def definitely tie the Fairbanks to this movement. But it seems to fit. The stewardship of wealth on behalf of the community for purposes of social reform and Christian benevolence, not the mere maximization of private profit, is the proper central economic motive of the capitalist. That's tenet number two. Number three, the economic system, like other systems in nature, when functioning properly, is governed by an equilibrium principle or harmony of interests, so that agriculture and manufacture, capital and labor, are still are all interdependent and will provide. Oh, excuse me, will proper, will prosper or suffer together. Agriculture and manufacturing, capital and labor are all independent and will prosper or suffer together. And finally, although hierarchical relations are necessary in society between parents and children, 
between employer and employees, and between the social classes. All men are entitled to earn such advancement in this hierarchy as their natural endowments, their moral qualities, and perseverance individually, individually entitled them to. I think we might need to remind ourselves that what was true of the Fairbanks is that they came from modest means, and so they would support the idea that other people could do the same thing. Uh, Charles Harbour and Morse was another example of the same phenomenon. Somebody who <coughs> came from very modest means began as an apprentice in the Fairbanks, um, Fairbanks factory here, and then went on to become extremely wealthy and somewhat powerful. Also, <coughs> in terms of weighing the Fairbanks, <coughs> their commitment to housing I found very interesting. And um, it's, it's displayed here in Patty Acres. But they were committed to, from, almost from the beginning, in providing housing for their workers. So yes, they didn't have health insurance. They didn't have retirement accounts. They didn't have social, social rules and things like that. But they, they committed to providing houses in the form of um, boarding houses, as I said, tenements, small houses, and about four other ways, too. They owned a lot of land, and they would sell it to their workers and let them build their own houses. When these houses were moved, what the arrangement was in terms of mortgages or who owned the land, I, I really don't know. It is true that the Fairbanks cared about the workers' per private lives more than a firm would today. And it's true that they considered Catholics and others to be a different sort of people than their own people. But I think that that gradually changed and th that evolved. So uh, uh, <coughs> a little, little take a couple of minutes to describe the end. What happened was that in 1887, <coughs> uh, uh, professional accountant from Boston was hired to do an accounting and an audit of the Fairbanks books. And this was in a period of time when they were trying to make a transition from a little family-owned company to a, 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 private, a publicly traded company with different fiduciary responsibilities. And so they hired a, an auditor from Boston. They set up a local committee to work with him and he said the books were a mess and I need another six months and I need another five people to help me to take care of this mess. It was quite a mess. And his, the audit was very critical and used very strong language. It said some of the act policies of the, and activities of the firm were singular and inexcusable. Others were reprehensible. Others were discreditable. And they included borrowing from the company depending on his, <laughs> if you borrow from your own company, that's borrowing from your own company, or it's, or it's something else. It's uh, plagiarism, uh, not plagiarism, but um, embezzlement, right. And uh, he found a, a lot of the borrowing. He found overvaluing of the company, creation of a dummy corporation, which never really did any business, Misuse of funds from the sale of new shares. They raised money by selling shares, but they didn't use it for what they said they were going to. Um, and it was a devastating uh, audit. That, as far as I can tell, did not result in a scandal because it wasn't known. A scandal is when somebody does something wrong and it gets known. <laughs> um, and the family scandal, the marital scandal, I think was known, but this one was not. But it certainly was known within the company, within the family, and probably within the business community of St. Johnsbury. That was in 1887 that was um, revealed. In 1888, William P. Fairbanks left town. He had been the secretary and treasurer of the company. <clears throat> he left town. And that was the family scandal. Also leaving town was a woman named Flora Sylvester. And there were two articles in the paper, but you had to put the two together. Her article, the article about her said she had transferred her affections to another. <laughs> um, the article about William P. said that he had, uh, he needed some time off. 
<laughs> we've been under stress. So that was in 88. In 89, the first non-Fairbanks uh, company head was hired. They brought somebody from the outside in to try to effect save the company. In 1895, both Franklin and this William guy died. William died young, young and Franklin died. <coughs> um, in 1911, there's still quite a bit of passage of time here, the company appointed an executive committee <coughs> to run the company. And I was fortunate enough to get the minutes of the executive committee from a member of the family, it was his grandfather, great-grandfather. I got the minutes of the executive committee, which showed all the problems that they were trying to deal with, trying to save the company in effect. And hired as, chosen as president at the time was a man named Frank Hilliard Brooks, who was Franklin Fairbanks' daughter's husband. So he's the first non-Fairbanks in name to run the company. And I think, he, sometimes he's blamed for the loss of the company. I think that he made a valiant attempt, and you can, the executive committee met, met almost weekly, and uh, they, they tried hard. But the problems that were identified in the audit were still with the company years later. So eventually, um, in 1916, Fairbanks Morris bought the Fairbanks company, and um, Frank Hilliard Brooks was out of a job, and before long he was out of a home. He was living in Undercliff and his family. And um, he stayed on with the company for a year in 1917, but then he resigned. And then in 1922, again, this is a symbolic event, Undercliff was sold, its contents were auctioned off, and the family moved. So that's the end of the story. That's the rise and fall. That's the fall part. But again, I don't want to overstate that because other branches and cousins and uncles and aunts were doing fine, but that was a sad part. And my source on that for a lot of that was uh, Franklin's great-granddaughter, a woman named Robin Spaulding who lives down in Worcester, and she was helped me with find some family documents and explain the family lore that accompanied this sad event. And then in 1927, just again, a little bit further along, but uh, there was a suicide also. So she and I had to talk about that Saturday. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying that in my own view, I don't know if I'm convincing or not, but I think the Fairbanks were basically good people for their time. Um, we can't judge them by our uh, standards and our rules and legislation, but I think they were pretty good. They're both in bo being both generous and responsible. And their legacy still survives in the form of the, the academy and the Athenaeum and the museum, and the North and South Church, and all, all many other things which they made possible. They made a lot of money from the family, but at least it's quite a bit of it they put back into the town. In my, my, my estimation, all three of those institutions the Academy, this institution, and Fairbanks Museum are thriving. They're doing fine. They're all pretty close to the original standards and mission that, um, that were set for them by the Fairbanks family. They have had to make their way as what I call hybrids, and, and all three of them are part public and part private. They're still all three are governed by independent boards, but um, the museum and the Athenaeum receive public funds in the form of special appropriations, and the academy receives a lot of public funds in the form of tuition. Um, so again, if you measure the physical legacy of the Fairbanks, it still is pretty intact. Um, one of the railroads is now a rail trail. The uh, um, YMCA is gone, but in general, the physical legacy is still there. Um, their historic example, is there something different about this town as a result of having such wonderful benefactors? You'll have to decide that for yourself. I don't really think so. <laughs> um, we are lucky to have had them, but I don't think that makes us a better town in terms of good relations between the social classes, our kindness and generosity with each other. Is there anything in the ethos of this town that we can identify? 
our strong belief in education, I think, is real. And from the beginning, education for the Fairbanks and at the academy was ac academic and vocational from the beginning. It was co-ed from the beginning. And it was also um, values-based. And they still have chapel at the academy. They still, they, the ACLU got after them in the 80s, but they, they uh, still have chapel and it's still what they call, what Tom Lovett called values-based. It still is trying to make better people of their students. So uh, whether a different or a better town because of their legacy, I'm not really sure, but the physical parts are pretty obvious. Thank you. Thank you. A little long. Hi, Tom. Do you um, know how much of the money that they I, I think so. The timing suggests it. In this critical audit, um, the figure, so if can I grab that? I'm not sure I can. The figure that they used for the borrowing, um, it was, I believe, was, let me just check that. But it was, it was a considerable amount of money. And but they said by the end of the audit, by the time the audit was published, it said that it had been repaid. But um, it's interesting in that regard that Franklin built the museum in 1891, and um, he died in 1895, and his daughter didn't have the wherewithal to hang on to the Undercliff. So that suggests that he had to tuck not that much away in his sock drawer. Does that answer your question? Yes. In your research, in your book, and Alan Yale's research, there doesn't seem to be any true indication of how profitable the company was on any one year. Was it a cash cow for only a relatively short period of time? And then that perhaps led to the fact that the third or fourth generations didn't necessarily blow the money it simply may not have been any money left. In, in profit? Yes. Yeah. And Alan says that, that he wishes he could find more financial information. And his, his um, thesis was, was pretty much numbers driven and financial. Um, the other thing that strikes me about the answer to that question is that after the Fairbanks, um, Fairbanks Morse bought the company, it still seemed to be making money because everyone wanted to buy it. And there was a struggle for control of Fairbanks Morse. And then there was a struggle for the separation uh, of the weighing industry from the rest of the big Fairbanks Morse conglomerate. And then every time that happened, it seems that it, it was a still making money. Um, and eventually, it was Fairbanks Scales was bought by a, a company in Kansas City, they still own it today, and they just separated the scale plant from the other parts of uh, Fairbanks Whitney or Cold Industries or whatever it was at the time. So it seems like the way, the way I, I, put, I wrote an article for the Mom Magazine, and the way I put it was that the values that were established by the Fairbanks brothers of quality work, good service, and innovation, those, were, those have been kept. They think scales are not flimsy, they're not cheap. And so that has sustained the company over the years. And so that is. Yes? I'm just uh, curious. I, my presumption is that the initial patents they had on the platform scale must have run out at some point where it just became, you know, uh, you know free for anybody to build a platform scale. When, you know when that happened? And did that play any role in the downfall of the company? Um, I don't think so, because they kept getting new patents for one thing, and fairing scales have changed with the technology. They've gone from the old lever and fulcrum and steelier technology to a use of um, other types of weighing apparatus, and they were all still are still are innovators. They use low cell technology and digital readouts and so forth. And I think what happened, if that answers your question, 
that they try to stay ahead of the changes in technology. And they, the question of whether Thaddeus invented the platform scale, um, I did find a, an article which dealt with that. And essentially, the answer was, no, not really. <laughs> but he didn't know about the other guy who was over in England. And he, with the same set of needs and the same d d dilemma for weighing, he, what he created was out of his own mind and imagination. And he got his American patents and went on from there. Yeah, I, I came across uh, mention where uh, two of the Fairbanks uh, had, went to see a man's invention in Concord. Who had the original idea of the scale, and they bought it from him. Uh, I, I don't have that. I, didn't know that. I don't remember yeah. where I came across yeah. it fairly recently. But. A man named Little, who worked for that is in Erastus, wrote an article in the North Star uh, back then, in which he said he gave the idea to Thaddeus that he had been in New York and he'd seen the platform scale embedded in the ground the way Thaddeus' hemp weighting scale was. Um, but but that's, that was his claim. That was his idea. Although, well, not his idea, but he had, he had seen it and he gave it to Thaddeus. But then Thaddeus ran with it. And it wasn't actually a very old idea. In the markets in Europe, they held up a, a balance. Yeah. And it's just a matter of making it larger. Well, the, the key change was to put the, the fulcrum on the ground. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, when did the factory burn? And you talk at all, or can you talk about the uh, creation of the new building, new facility? Sure, that's, that's in the book. Um, in around 1962, Fairbanks and Morrison announced that they didn't know what they were going to do. They kind of put out the alarm. And uh, St. John's Bridge. Freaked out. Um, and in fact, uh, Phil Hoff and Albert Cree and others in the state grouped together and decided, let's do what we can to help this ancient old business stay, in, stay uh, going. And they raised a lot of money. The town raised money. I remember, I can remember the, at least the celebration. And the kids, you know, they gave up their lunch money or, or so, I don't know, allowances. It was a town-wide effort to raise some money, and they located the land out on Portland Street. So that, I believe, there was a lot of suspense for people that waiting to see what Fairbanks Morse was going to do, or Cold Industries, I guess it was, what it was going to do. And finally, there was a big announcement. And I can remember, I think, it's maybe one of those memories where, maybe it's not true, but I kind of remember, I think I was a member of the student council, when we stood in the, uh, St. John's Bay House steps, and there was a kind of torch lit parade or something. And I, I keep meaning to ask my childhood friends if they remember that or something I made up. But uh, <laughs> there was a big celebration, and the factory was was built. Interestingly enough, it was it was really overbuilt in terms of space because the technology was in in changing in, in flux at that time. And they didn't need foundries, and they didn't need as big a machine shop. So a lot of space, and as you probably know, it's got three or four other tenants today out of that building. But it's a, it's a very, you, you said it's, it's turned, it's, it has turned out to be pretty flexible and functional building. Very clean and well lit now. Yes? Did you find in your research anywhere, as uh, the business was growing, getting bigger, getting uh, richer, and the town was developing. Did you find in your research that the family or the business at all resented the Chittenden County in the western part of the state? Did that come up at all in no, the I research? I didn't stumble on that. No. You didn't come across no. that. I just wondered if that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. You know, we're not as, this is not our, our high point of the town. Uh, you know, the, the golden era of St. John's Bay right now. You said uh, this was before closure, closure. and I'm wondering if people are injured on the job, was the Fairbanks company take care of them in the hospital? 
They did. Yeah, they did. Um, they had a, a fund which they contributed to. And they were really nice to their workers in, in most respects, again, for the era. Um, it, when you got old, they tried to find easier work for you to do and hang on to you as long as they could. If you were going to be out for a while, there was a workers' benevolent fund or something that would help you get by. In down periods, they, were, they tended to cut back people in their hours rather than lay off anybody. And so they followed a number of practices as detailed by Alan Hale, a number of practices to treat their workers right. When they were actively expanding, did they, or rapidly expanding, did they actively recruit immigrants to get workers? I don't know, Tim. I, they got them. <laughs> uh, when they actively recruited them, I don't, that's a good question. Yeah. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the model industry, uh, wasn't there stuff, I mean, a lot of people coming for that, and it might have been an accept of workers available as a result? That might be where the Italians came from, you're right. <laughs> Uh, and the Irish came here to build the railroad, and many of them stayed. And then the famine Irish uh, in the 1840s. So, but they, they had such a worldwide network that might have helped them in recruiting, you know, to, to uh, they had agents and stores and selling houses all over the world. Yes? Well, first I'd like to thank you for putting in all the work to find out about all this information. It's pretty cool that somebody's collected all that. I'm sure it'll be useful for future generations. Thank you. And uh, something I'd like to say is hearing about the Fairbanks, especially the first and second generation, I was uh, very impressed just to hear all the little tidbits about how they manage their business or what they, their involvement politically or culturally, economically, all of it. And I think we should be careful before we maybe pass judgment on them for being not up to speed with the way we think of things today. And kind of, you know, be mindful of where we're sitting right now in the building constructed by them and endowed to the town by them. I think we shouldn't look down on them in any way. Thank you. Um, <laughs> They, in a way, they invited judgment because they were preachers, okay? So you can not look for hypocrisy in the case of people who tell other people how to behave. Uh, uh, and so that's fair, I think. But you're talking more about industrial issues and safety and how they treated their workers. And I think you're right. We have to more or less judge them by their own era. Yep. Uh, Dan, you were talking about they had agents and warehouses all over, and it seemed like in the end, the agents, mainly Charles Hosmer Morris, came to take over the Fairbanks company. It makes me think of like if the AT&T store on Railroad Street took over AT&T eventually. Did they make really bad contracts? How did that- They made really bad contracts. <laughs> that was in the 1887 audit, as well as in the executive committee minutes that I was able to read. They, they signed terrible contracts with their selling houses, and the so two, two selling houses, one in New York and one in Chicago, became conglomerates and had other business and other manufacturing of their own. And so they signed really poor contracts with those two in particular, and they had, they had eaten some other little fish, so that they were, they were pretty big. And uh, that was in the audit. And also, really strong language in the, in the executive committee minutes, they sent poor um, Mr. Brooks around trying to deal with these other two companies. They have some meetings and try to work something out. There was some very strong language used on both sides. But essentially, that was part of their downfall. They signed some really bad contracts and they were squeezed, is the way the word I use in the book. So they couldn't couldn't make scales for these prices, and yet they had agreed upon prices with the selling houses. So a co uh, corollary for today, I'm not really sure, but it would be the child um, buying out the parent, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Okay.